Hello, my name is Jeremy, and today I'm going to be taking a look at a game by the name of Hadara. This is uh, published by Hans and Gluck in Germany. This is a German edition, although there is a Z-Man edition of this coming in uh, the summer of 2019, so if you want to wait for that, you can. If not, uh, the game is entirely language independent. I published a English rules translation for the game on Board Game Geek. Uh, so you could use that if you'd like. The game is a uh, civilization building a card drafting game, similar somewhat to uh, Seven Wonders, uh, and it plays in about 45 minutes or so for about two to five players. Box has ages 10 and up. I certainly think a 10 year old would be able to f follow this. It's relatively straightforward. Indeed, it's uh, probably simpler than Seven Wonders is. So I will take a few minutes, show you how the game plays, come back, and give you my thoughts on it. So Hadar is a city game played over three eras, and players are going to be playing uh, competing civilizations. Each of them is going to track their civilization's progress on this board, this player board, that they get, as well as through the cards that they acquire, which will place underneath the uh, player board. At the start of the game, each player is going to get a card, which shows basically their starting money, their starting stats, these four categories. Um, They'll start with their markers on the corresponding spaces. These represent essentially income, military, culture, and food supply. There's a, a fifth category, which is basically a special category, but those are the uh, different types of cards that are in the game. Um, and then it'll also have an initiative number here. This Whoever has a lower initiative uh, will be the first player in the first round. Um, person with the second lowest initiative will be the first player in the second round person with the third lowest initiative will be the uh, first player in the third round. If there are more players than that, each player who will never become first player, because there's only three rounds, will get um, a coin as a compensation. So players will set up their boards according to those cards. Uh, you can actually pick from an A or a B side with the card that you're randomly given, so there can be some differentiation or choice in your stats. Uh, then you'll just keep that card to the side. And uh, then you'll set up also this uh, player board or I'm sorry, this cardboard, where you're going to put two cards of the era one cards, again, we're playing over three eras, uh, per player, per color. So the, they'll essentially be, in a two-player game, four cards from the stack of the era one cards in each of these five colors. Then whoever's the first player, which in this case would be this player with their one initiative number, they're going to get to choose to rotate this, and basically their symbol is marked on their player board. Here they're playing the dragon and they could choose which of these five piles they want to draft from first. And you can see it has the other player symbols on this wheel here that will also determine which uh, the other players are going to be drafting from first. So if the first player picks this one first, this player here, who's the uh, monkey, according to their player board, will actually dra draft from here first, the uh, red cards. So let's say this player does this. What you're going to do, and what each player can basically do simultaneously for this first phase, is draw two cards from the stack where your symbol is pointing, and then you are going to essentially discard one of these cards back to here, and then you can play one in front of you, or sell it by basically discarding out of the game entirely for money. And you can see on the back of the card it shows you, at, in era one, you're going to get two money if you discard the uh, card out. So these cards, um, generally speaking, they're going to advance you along these tracks plus get you victory points. Although these purple ones um, are going to have some special powers on it. So for example, these two special powers here. This one, it basically gives you one extra advancement for every red card that you have or acquire in the future, as long as you hold this card. And this one, if ever you sell a card, again, your second choice is to basically discard a card out. Instead of getting $2 in the uh, first round, you would get $3. So it just adds one to every card that you would sell in the future. So maybe this player might choose to buy this card. So on the uh, card, you could see the uh, cost down in this corner. It would cost two money, and it would provide two victory points at the end of the game. So this player would just simply place it there. They would discard the other card, and then they would pay their two money back to the bank. Like I said, simultaneously, this player will be drawing from the red pile. They'll take two cards, look at them, and they'll, they'll choose one of these to keep. And so the cards in the purple piles tend to have special powers on them, whereas the cards in the other piles uh, tend to be more the same. So generally the cards in, the, you know, for example, the red pile will advance you on your red track, maybe do some other subsidiary advancements, like this one would advance on both red and blue, and then they'll generally give you some victory points. So let's say this player wanted to buy this one, they would pay the uh, two money, 
place it under the red slot on their board, discard the other card, like I said, pay their two money, and then get uh, three advancements on the red track. Then after that happens, this wheel will just rotate one space. So now the green player, or this player's symbol is pointing to green, this player's monkey symbol is pointing to yellow. So, you know, this player will take two of these cards, pick one, do something with it, either buy it or sell it, discard the other card, and so on. So this one here, for example, they would pay three money for that, and then they would get to go up uh, three on this track. And they would also earn two points at the end of the game for that. This player, they could take one of these two. So maybe they would take this one, um, put it here, discard the other one, pay the four money for it, and go up two extra spaces on this track. So something else that's going to happen during the uh, course of the game is that as you acquire these cards, you're going to get discounts on cards of the same color. So this player here has a green card. If they acquired another green card in the future, they would get a discount of one for every green card that they already had. So, um, you know, at, at the start, it would just be a discount of one. Once they acquire a second green card, it's a discount of two and so on. You can never get a rebate for buying cards. You'll always essentially have to um, pay at most zero, but you can't get money back for buying a card, but you can reduce your cost, which is important because over the three eras of the game, so the cards are going to get more expensive. So once players have done that, you'll simply rotate the, uh, the dial here again, draw from the corresponding pile, and so on. So you'll do this five times until the wheel makes itself, or goes around once entirely, and there will be essentially um, two discarded cards in each of these piles, and all of these players will basically have either five cards that they've played in front of them um, by buying or that they've discarded out of the game for money. All of these draw piles here then at that point will be empty. At this point the game goes into some essentially um, subsidiary uh, decisions. So there is a player aid, let me just grab that. So my copy is in German but it's really easy because it's color coded. You'll go through these three phases, the yellow, red, and blue phases or phases at the end of your uh, your card buying. So the yellow phase, you just simply look at your income level and you get that much money. So here the player has three on their yellow track, they would get three dollars. Then this player over here has four, they would get four dollars. So that's one way that you're gonna be able to get extra money without having to sell cards and forego building cards. The next thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna look at um, whether or not you could acquire a colony. So at the uh, start of the game, you're going to set out these stacks of tiles, which are colonies. So on these co colonies, there's going to be a military value that's required to uh, capture the colony, a number of victory points that it will provide, and then these two symbols up here. So first of all, you check to see if you can actually meet any of these requirements. And they go from 3 to 9 to 15 to 21 to 30. But the victory points, you know, start at 2 here and go all the way up to 16 at the uh, highest value one. So this player here only has 2 military. They wouldn't be able to buy one. This player here uh, would be able to buy one because they have 4 military. So what they'll do is they'll take the uh, top stack, or top tile of the stack. And then they have to make a decision. Uh, and I should note that when you get your income, you don't go down on the income track. When you use your military, you don't go down on the military track. When you use your culture, you don't go down. When you use your food, you don't go down. You only ever go up on those tracks for the most part over the course of the game. Um, so in any case, this player here, looking at their uh, military, they have four military, so they can acquire this three military. If they somehow had nine military, they could take that one instead. You don't have to acquire these in order, but you could generally only acquire one per military phase. So this uh, colony, they could get, so, since they have the, uh, military, the military requirement. Then they're f faced with this choice. You can see it has plus three money or minus one money with this uh, turnover symbol. So essentially this means that they could conquer and pillage the um, region. They would still get these two victory points and then they would also uh, get three money right away. Or they could choose to become an ally with this colony they won't get the three money, but it would cost them one money. And if they do that, they actually get to flip the tile and get what is additionally on the back side of the tile, which will also be 
which will always be at least this many victory points, perhaps more, and perhaps advancements on here. So let's say this player paid the, the one money. They would then flip this over, and they get to place this in front of them. So they would get, you know, two points at the end of the game, but they'd also now get one more advancement on their military and culture track. So they would just put that face down in front of them, just so they could remember that they can't take another level three colony again. So each player would do this in turn order, have the cho choice to buy one of these. And you can never buy the, the level 3 one again once you acquire the level 3, so you can only get one of these generally per round. Um, and you can um, buy them out of order if you so desire. Then the next thing that's going to happen is players are going to look at their uh, the busts on their, their board. And this is basically uh, putting your culture into practice. So you'll look at your culture track and you'll see if you can meet one of these requirements which are 6 culture, 12 culture, 20 culture, or 30 culture. If you can meet one of those, again, you could build one of these uh, busts. Now the options are that you could basically do these in any order. You can only do one per round, much like the colonies, and you can only do each of them once. So this player and this player, neither of them have 6 uh, culture, but let's say this player had 6 culture. If they wanted to build this um, bust, what they would have to do is choose one of these eight tiles that you're going to start with at the beginning of the game. And these correspond with the four different tracks that the players have. And they'll slot one of those into there. And they could do it either this side up, so you could see, let's say they put this food one up in here. Then what they'll do is they'll essentially get the victory points that are printed on the board here. So four victory points at the end of the game. And you can see that goes all the way up to 22 if you build the hardest to achieve bust. Um, then so that's guaranteed. Then this is essentially a multiplier that functions on this token here. So you can see it's a 2, and it'll function on the green, so that we get two free advancements on the green. Um, the option is to place any of those four in there, so you can advance on any of those tracks, or what you could do is choose to flip any of those over to get endgame victory points. So this would essentially be one victory point times two. That would be two bonus points at the end. So you could see if you put, for example, this victory point tile here, um, at the end of the game, you would get 22 victory points plus another 6 for building that and putting the victory point tile here. So that could be another way to, to score victory points. So those are the three phases that you would go through at the end of that drafting phase. The um, income, the colony, and the carving of the busts. So once you've done that, then you're going to go into phase uh, B. Now in phase B, again starting with the same starting player, players are going to be able to draft but they're going to ignore this wheel here, and they're going to be able to draft cards from any of these five areas. The catch being that they can only take the uh, face-up card uh, on these discard piles. So this player could take any of these five face-up cards. So maybe they'll take this one, and they'll build it out. You know, again, it cost, you can see here it costs two money. They have one green card already, so it only costs them one money. And then they would go up two on their green track. So they would go from nine to eleven. The game comes with these plus 10 markers, so whenever you essentially reach the end of your track, you just slot a plus 10 here, start back at the uh, start of your track. So you can keep track of that pretty easily. Um, and then this player would go, and they would be able to draft a card and do the same, either build it out, recruit it into their tableau, or to sell it for cash. So this player only has one money, so they might choose to sell the card. Uh, so they would flip it over, discard it out of the game entirely, and they would get two money for doing that. And it'll go back and forth now with players drafting these cards until all of them are gone. So again, you'll basically take, each player will take five cards in the first phase, five cards in this phase. And that will con essentially cons uh, constitute an era. Then after the players have you completely emptied out this, you're going to go through those same three phases again. The income, the colony phase, and the uh, bust phase. So... After players have done that, then there's going to be two extra things that happen at the end of an era before you go into the next era. The first thing is that you're going to have to look at your feeding track. So again, there's these four tracks on here. This fourth one, the green one, is the feeding track. So this represents how much food you have, and essentially you need to have one food for each card that you've built below your tableau here. So this player, again, this I didn't play out the entire round, but this player built three cards. They would have to have at least three food in order to do that. They have 11, so they're fine. This player here has four food. They have only have two cards down here. They'd be fine. If you did not have enough food to meet the number of cards that you have built down here, you have to discard cards out until you can meet that. So you obviously wouldn't want to discard ones that show food because that, you would still have to just discard another card because, let's say I have to discard this card out, 
with which gave the uh, player two income, they, they would actually have to drop back two on their income track. So you would never want to discard a card out that would drop you back on the food track. It would be counterproductive. But once all players have um, essentially made sure that they've met their feeding requirements, um, then you will go on to the final part of the phase, which is essentially right here purchasing these bonus markers and you can see there are silver and gold bonus markers that are going to increase over the cost over the three phases and these are tied to this part of your player board up here so you can see there's two slots for silver and two slots for gold tokens up on the uh, player boards so silver and gold at the uh, start of the game each player is going to get two of these gold tokens when they pay to put one of those up here again uh, obeying the costs that are on here um, this will just trigger an end game scoring for them. At the end of the game, for every symbol that you have on here, and every set of five cards of different colors that you have down here, so if for, there are five colors of cards in the game, uh, you'll get seven points. So if you have both of these here, each set of five cards that you have uh, below your player board at the end of the game will be worth 14 points. So that's how those work. The way that these work, uh, the silver air medals essentially, when you get those, you're going to slot one of your figures into one of these little uh, tokens into that space. And at the end of the game, for you count out how many advancements you have on that track. So here this player you know, has three. They would get essentially a half point for each advancement rounded up. So if they had three advancements on there, they would get two points for that. So you could have up to two of those silver ones and up to two of the gold ones. And like I said, they get more expensive over the course of the game. So you want to buy them early, but at the same time, uh, by the same uh, turn, money is tighter early. Um, but you can buy any number of those in a given round, unlike the carving of the bus and the game of colonies where you're limited to doing one per round. You can buy as many of those as you'd like. Okay, so after you've done that, you'll just you know go into the round two deck. Um, or era two deck and put you know again two cards per player on each of these start player will change again the person who has the second lowest number on their starter card will become start player for round two and then you'll go through all those phases again first the uh, draft where each player takes two and picks one then you go through these you know three um, phases here then the uh, second draft where uh, players draft from the discard piles and uh, again go through those phases again with the uh, a chance to buy medals and the ob obligation to feed your people. Same thing repeats for Era 3, and then you'll go into the uh, final scoring. So the final scoring is pretty simple. There's a, a score pad provided in the game, and essentially what you're going to do is get points for your colonies that you've conquered. So again, those are the points that are printed on the uh, colony tiles. You will get points for any of the busts that you've carved out. So if you have tokens here, Plus, if you have point tokens in here, you'll add up those points. Third thing will be your points for your silver medals. I just explained how those work. And your gold medals for your full sets of the five different colors of cards. Then you'll add up the points from the cards that you have built over the course of the game. So they'll all have, or most of them will have victory points on them. Finally, the uh, last category is essentially you could turn in money. Uh, every five money that you turn in will give you a point. You keep any leftover money that will serve as a tiebreaker if there's a tie after summing up those points. Otherwise, whoever has the most points is going to win. All right, so that is Adara. And as you can see, this is a fairly simple game, certainly by the standard of civilization building games. This is a really straightforward game. Um, it's, it, it's, I think one of the strengths of the game is that it's very easy to explain. Uh, Although it's played over three eras, you're going to be doing the same thing from era to era. Um, although it has a lot of cards in it, almost all of the cards ha um, have the same symbology on it. Only the purple cards require any real additional rules explanation beyond the very basics of what a card costs and what a card does. So I think that's a real strength of the game. Um, I, I think that... Um, it's definitely easier than Seven Wonders, whereas Seven Wonders requires a lot of upfront rules explanation because of the nature of the drafting in that game. Um, if a player doesn't know what a card does, it really break, bogs down the game to stop and explain that. In this, because of the way that the drafting works, players could basically play simultaneously, and they're not really keeping cards hidden from e each other. Essentially, um, if you have two cards in your hand, you're going to have to play one and discard one. So it doesn't really 
give away any secrets to ask what one of those two cards does because they're both going to be public information almost immediately. So I think that's a real boon to teaching this game to um, people as you're playing it the first time or two. Um, so although it's a lot simpler, um, and indeed I, I, I think that there's a few drawbacks inherent in its simplicity. First of all, I think from a thematic standpoint, it doesn't necessarily feel like you're building a city. It's satisfying, I think, to figure out the puzzle and to hit those thresholds so you're going to be able to acquire the next colony or build that next bust or, uh, you know, even feed your people. But at the same time, um, the since there's no map in the game and there's very little interaction between the uh, different players, uh, it doesn't necessarily feel like you're, you know, guiding a great civilization through the ages or what have you. Um, that being said, it's still, I think, satisfying as a rather abstract puzzle that you're going to be, you know, trying to optimize for your, for yourself over the course of the game. Um, you are going to have different incentives than other players, and watching that play out is still interesting. It's just, I think if players are expecting it, this to be more of a Civ game, they might be disappointed in that. It's really almost um, an abstract game abstract card game with uh, some, you know, very light sieve touches. Um, again, also, uh, that also comes through in the fact that it's not interactive at, almost at all. You know, the difference between two to five players is really minor, even in terms of playtime. Um, essentially, uh, the first phase of the game you can play almost simultaneously, and then the uh, second phase of the game you're making very quick decisions. So it only takes a few extra minutes to add players in. Again, that's a strength of the game. But uh, it might be a drawback for players who are looking for um, a way to impede their opponents. You could take a card um, that you think an opponent might w want, but that's really all that you can do to interact with each other. In, in, in terms of, you know, again, comparing this to maybe Seven Wonders just be because it's a similarly themed game that players are probably familiar with, there's not even a mechanism like the uh, military mechanism where you could... Um, attack the players who are sitting next to you or what have you. There's nothing like that in the game. So um, I think some players might find that to be disappointing. I personally don't mind it, but I do understand why that might be a drawback. Um, what I do mind a little bit, and again, this is still a game I would recommend it, um, is that the nature of the cards is very incremental. Um, only the purple cards are really ever exciting. The other ones are always just going to bump you up a few steps on a track or maybe on two different tracks a few steps. And they're always going to cost a few dollars to get points. So some of the cards might give you more points but fewer advancements. Some of them will give you more advancements but fewer points. But um, essentially you're working generally with four of the five decks with the same you know general set of parameters. and there's very few surprises to be had in, in the decks. I, I think that for some players that might make the game feel dry. Um, the purple decks are interesting. It does suggest you pull some of those purple cards out for your first game and then you know bring in other cards later, but that's really not necessary. There's nothing super complex in that deck of purple cards. You can pretty much play with them all your first time and not run into any major rules problems. Um, and they do allow for some more interesting strategies and some interesting combos and some shortcuts along around the uh, brute force of just uh, bringing up your tracks. There's ones that discount, for example, the colonies or the uh, carving of things, and there's one that's ones that let you make multiple purchases in a round. So there's things like that, or ones that give you extra money whenever you trash cards. There's a few different like interesting ways that you could tweak the engine building of the game. And I suppose there's also the main strategic consideration of whether or not you want to focus on one track and then buy the silver medal to like, turn that progress in that track into points at the end of the game, or try to build out an even, even tableau of sets of cards and buy the gold medals that really capitalize on that. So trying to balance those two things is going to be a factor for most players. So there are, there are certainly decisions to be made, but they are pretty dry decisions in um, again, the theme of the game is interesting and the card art is really good and colorful, but I, I think that misleads players who might be expecting another type of game than what this is. Um, again, the actual play of the game, though, I think is extremely smooth. Um, it's a game that, once you start playing it, players will grasp it immediately. It plays very, like I said, almost simultaneously or very quickly. Um, and then, you know, it's three very quick rounds, back to back. And there's a sense of progression among those rounds, so there's some satisfaction in that as well. Um, 
the drafting mechanism is really clever too. So when you're choosing to trash a card, um, you might trash it just you know like in Seven Wonders just to get it out of the game entirely. Um, if you have to discard one of those cards into the discard pile, you have a hope of getting it again or of another player getting it during the second drafting phase where you go into those discard piles. So the timing of that is interesting and it's pretty satisfying the way that you know just by drafting you know drawing two cards, keeping one card. Uh, doesn't sound like much, but it actually does lead to some interesting decisions. And um, the second draft where those piles are communal does a, is what allows you to specialize because essentially in the first half of the game, each player is going to get two cards from each pile, pick one. So everybody's going to get five cards, one from each pile. But then in the second half of the game, what you could do is just really you know hammer down on one pile, which not only makes you specialize in, but also depletes that pile, reduces the chance that other players are going to be able to get a card from that pile. So that's that's really interesting, and I think that's a pretty novel way for drafting to work in the game. And um, I think that, um, you know, in general, just thinking about, you know, the points optimization within those parameters of whether or not you want to generalize or spread out is enough meat for a game that lasts 45 minutes or so. So in all, this is a game that I think is really well designed. Um, it's a game that plays extremely smoothly and it's um, really satisfying despite it's a you know almost total lack of you know thematic you know depth. But um, I think that's a game that you you know if you're expecting something like you know a Sid Meier Civilization game you might want to try it before you buy it. Personally I like it. I like how cleanly it plays. I think I probably have played Seven Wonders enough that this is this feels fresh to me where Seven Wonders feels a pretty routine at this point and I don't generally want to play that so this is nice to have a game that feels similar enough to that that um, it scratches that same itch but it has some novelty to it. Um, I'm not sure how much you know, this will hold its appeal over the long term. I've played it several times now but um, I could imagine just you know always essentially using the same number of cards or the same decks of cards from game to game could peter out but really you know the nature of the game where you're just sliding up you know chits along various tracks does mean that it's almost abstract enough that maybe that it doesn't need any more polish or any more bells and whistles than what it has so in all it's a game that i enjoy um one that i personally would recommend but um i think people should know what they're getting into i hope this video helped you to see what you'd be getting into with this game so those are my thoughts on hadara and thank you for watching.